This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash knowhow. And by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what they're paying now, Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades, they want you to try their shave set for free. Just pay shipping. Start your free trial today at harrys.com slash knowhow. Today on Know How, an affordable gaming laptop, a mystery box from Synology, your questions, our answers. Know how it's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Ballisar. I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to open up that dusty old box known as your knowledge hole, right. where we're going to cram in a bunch of knowledge. <laughs> Otherwise known as the mystery knowledge hole, right? The mystery knowledge hole. It just makes it sound better, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's a little uh, more of an enigma wrapped it's, it's in an enigma mystery space box. For unicorn tears. Unicorn tears. You saw the Starbucks drink, right? That they've been. I releasing? saw a picture that. Gave me a close-up of how much sugar mm -hmm. was in that. 78 grams of sugar in we, that one drink. We got one for Jerry here, and I could unicorn. feel the sugar. It, <laughs> I started vibrating when I was standing next to it. I, I, uh, I tweeted this out, and uh, the, the writers of The Expanse retweeted it. It was a... Uh, I was at a Starbucks in San Francisco, and I, I guess it was like a one-day thing, like yeah. the unicorn drink. Yeah, yeah I and think so. there was a customer who was like... Because <laughs> they kill all their customers if they kept selling <laughs> it, but yeah. But he was, he's like, hey, don't you put no proto-molecule in my latte. And uh, the customer was, and the barista was oh, like, yeah. oh, you got it, Baratna. And so if you're an Expanse fan, like you're, oh, geeks. So and, and since I'm not... You're not. And, <sighs> I mean, I could be, but I haven't watched the show, so just... Nerd. It's like it's like a cross between Battlestar Galactica and Game of Thrones in space. It's it's nice. <laughs> You'd like it. incest in space. You've got, got Amazon, it. right? Yeah, I got Amazon. So you can watch the entire first series. I'm too busy working on this show to do <laughs> to watch The Expanse. That is totally not true at mm. all. <laughs> but we do have a lot for you. Not only do we have your questions and our answers, not only do we have an affordable gaming notebook yes. and maybe an accessory that I picked up that I've just grown to love, but I, literally, we, we I got a mystery box. So I, a box dropped on my my uh, my lab yesterday. <laughs> Should I be scared? Like, Maybe. Well, <laughs> the only thing, because it says Synology on the outside. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Right. But they didn't tell me what it is. When I wrote them, they didn't tell me. So I'm like, you know what? We're going to open this live. It's a Trojan horse. It could be. It's a Trojan horse. Now, so either it's a NAS or... This could be it's, the last episode of Know How. It's going to be more of those Starbucks unicorn drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Just to melted. Kill everyone. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and kick it off. We've got one that was an email mm -hmm. uh, to us from a man by the name of Robbie Britton. And Robbie wanted to point out that he loves the show. Yeah, Thanks, good, Robbie. Good. And he asked, I, ha I got a lot of great info from your vlog podcast episodes. My question is, when I start my own podcast, do I need to pay uh, a site to host my video content, or is YouTube good enough? Good question. Mm -hmm. Actually, I hear this a lot because YouTube is very alluring. Not yes. only not only is it free, not and only can ease you know... Ease of use. It's super easy to use. Not only does it have accessibility to millions and, and millions across the planet, so right. therefore it has a lot of discovery potential. A lot of advantages. But it also does things like live. And who doesn't want the option to do live on the same channel, the same platform that you use to, to serve out your uh, your podcasts. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you can do it with your phone. Yep. You can just send a link to someone. You can host uh, you know, multiple links on a different website. So it's not a bad option, but my only hesitation is if you start, YouTube takes a cut. Yes. And if they ever decide that they don't like the content that you're producing, they could just end it. Yeah. So. And I mean, seriously, this has been a problem for even the biggest YouTubers. There's, uh, like, there's, there's a reason why we still have a website. Yeah. <laughs> not just I, on YouTube. I, because, I mean, it, it doesn't even need to be a malicious. It's not like it's someone at, at YouTube saying, yeah, you know what? We hate you. Forget it. We're never going to, we're never going to recommend your videos again. It could be a slight tweak of the algorithm, which mm -hmm. they do all the time because that's how they stop people from gaming the system. Yes. But they tweak, and suddenly, you know, you go from getting 
3 million views per episode to 10,000. Well, right. that's a huge drop. Not, and it's not just the number of views you get. They also could change the type of advertising that ends up on your channel. That's a good point. And yeah. then suddenly the 3 million views, rather than being worth, what, $3,000, it's now worth 30 bucks. That, that could be a problem. Right, so there, there have been YouTube stars that I've followed in the past that have decided to do their own thing once yeah. they got big, um, mostly because there is some change in, in some of the legal stuff yeah. so that yeah. they w couldn't host their videos there anymore. But if you're just trying to get started and you have content that you want to get out, that's a good option. Yeah, I, I, what I would say is absolutely. YouTube is a no-brainer. I mean, we, we do YouTube. We get like 1% of our views from YouTube, but we still do it because we understand it's good for discovery. Mm -hmm. People might happen across your channel. They might happen across your show, across your, your podcast, and that's a good, good thing. But and, and this this was a big reason for why Twit is Twit. Leo did not want the network to be beholden to a distributor, and essentially YouTube has become the distributor. Yes, uh, that's that was the whole philosophy behind Twit, and I I'm a firm believer in that. I like owning my content. It's not as if you're giving it away when you put it on YouTube, but you do allow others to take a chunk of it. Now, yes. if you're just starting off, that's not even a concern. You just need to get your name out of there, but you may want to use the time to go ahead and start building up a parallel presence. That's mm -hmm. what we've done here at Twit. So are there any other options that you would recommend other than YouTube? Yeah, I, I, I don't get expensive. Uh, anything you do, keep it simple, use a free account. You could use something like the Internet Archives, which allows mm -hmm. free space, but the problem is it is fantastically slow. Yes. Don't even think about doing a video podcast there. You could do an audio podcast, maybe. There's things from WordPress that you could use that, mm -hmm. that are a decent amount of storage. There is one I want to suggest, and it's not just because they're a sponsor of the Twit TV network. It's I recently started playing with their service, and it's it's fantastic. I didn't know they had a free service, but they do. Hmm. It's called Cloudflare. Alex, if you go ahead and show them that. They have a free tier that costs you nothing. Now, there are a couple of limitations. The most you can upload at any given time, a, a single client, is 100 megabytes. Uh, so, you know, it's shorter episodes, but that really shouldn't be a problem. But you get all the cool things that Cloudflare is known for. It's DDoS protection. You can run your blog. You can run your web page. You can have videos and pictures up there. You, what I would do is I would actually create a website with my branding mm -hmm. on Cloudflare's free plan. I would embed my YouTube videos. Exactly, so there's a place yeah. that people can, can go to, watch the YouTube videos, but I own the, the real estate. I can right. own the ad space around it. And then maybe also offer them additional content on your website that mm -hmm. they cannot get on YouTube. Yeah, no, that's a good suggestion. And depending on the content that you're using, like mm -hmm. obviously this is going to be video content because right. he's uploading to a video service. But if you weren't, you would just be uploading to like iTunes or something right. or SoundCloud. Although Patrick has told me not to use SoundCloud yeah. for podcasting because yeah. I guess if you get locked in, it's kind of a pain you're after done. that. Yeah. But if you're focused on uploading like really beautiful videos, um, more than YouTube, I'd probably recommend Vimeo. Vimeo Have you ever yeah. used that before? Yes, and Vimeo gives you much more control of your content than yeah. YouTube does. That, that's the, what I would recommend. Because there's a few videos that I've done where I wanted it to be like cinematic, and sometimes YouTube has a um, tendency to compress like my GoPro videos. Yeah. And so if I do a video in 4K or I wanted to do 1080 at 60 frames per second, YouTube is perfectly capable of doing that. Something sometimes with the compression algorithm, it gets like chunk, I get chunky videos just because there's so much fast motion in mm -hmm. my videos. So just another option. It depend, and I've noticed like Vimeo does a better job of like video compression with my stuff. I'm seeing more artists who are pushing to Vimeo because they can control how it's seen and mm -hmm. they control control where it's seen. You know, some creators they really don't want their stuff seen on a mobile device. And, you know, for them, it's, it's an artistic point. thing. It's like, no, I don't want you to watch my beautifully rendered whatever it might be on a four-inch screen. I want you to be at least on the laptop. Hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, Vimeo gives you that kind of granular control. The, the idea with YouTube is everyone can see everything everywhere. Yes. And that's good. That's, that's not a bad strategy. But if your content is a bit more upscale, and mm -hmm. if you're looking at doing a controlled release where you can get some serious statistics about who's watching and when, mm -hmm. yeah, Vimeo is actually a good platform. Yeah, and I think also um, there's a little bit of a learning curve on YouTube with uh, SEO yeah. and learning what tags to use and stuff. But once you start making content and uploading to YouTube, um, you can then get a sense of if it works or not for you and then maybe move to something else depending on, on yeah. how, that, how that works. 
All right, let's go ahead and move on. We've got another one here from Carlos Vélez. Carlos. <laughs> Carlos asks, I got the Maker Select V2 based on the show's recommendation. I want to go bigger and I'm trying to build an LED bridge I downloaded from Thingiverse. It's a huge project with lots of parts. It started to print out well, but screwed up at the last minute. The project requires I print about 16 of these. I know there are ways to identify what might I might have set up incorrectly based on how the print job failed, but I'm still too new to identify. Was hoping somebody could help. This is what was printed on PLA at 255, um, I'm guessing Fahrenheit temperature, non-heated bed at default speed. Okay. Alex, if you go ahead and, and click on that, then you can scroll back and forth. There's three pictures. So this is what happened. As you can tell, there's, okay, well, just freeze here. There's a mm. few things you can see. Automatically, he's got a layer adhesion problem. That's what the filament is. It just it didn't stick, and then it just started spraying everywhere. This this actually happens so a lot. So this spaghetti is not supposed to be there. That I'm spaghetti assuming. is not supposed <laughs> to be there. And, and actually, if you flip to the next one, I think he gives us an, another angle. You can also see the construction is bowed. And whenever I see bowed, mm -hmm. see like at the bottom, look at look how it's sitting on the counter. At the yes. bottom, if it bows like that, it means you're getting bad. It's not just layer adhesion. You're getting bad build plate adhesion. So it did not stick to the platform. Now, here's a weird thing. He said that this was printed on a non-heated bed. The, the Maker Select version 2, by default, it's has heated. a heated bed. Huh. So it means he turned it off. I'm not sure why you turned it off. Turn that back on. What you're finding is, a uh, this is thermal variance problem. So mm -hmm. if material, the same material that's connected in layers cools at two different temperatures. Remember, as a material heats up, it will expand. As a mm -hmm. material cools, it will contract. So what will happen is, as the top layer cools, it will contract and has a tendency to pull up the bottom layer. I've had that problem a yeah, lot. Yeah. yeah, and so a heated bed, it doesn't get rid of the problem, but it really does reduce it. So the first thing is, turn the heated bed back on. I, I don't even know where the, the selector is to turn it off on my on my V2. That does seem strange. Uh, I mean, let's operate under the assumption that either Either he has it turned off, or he maybe he, he doesn't know. Doesn't know. Yeah. But also, I think for me, the thing that solved some of the prints that I had that problem with the adhesion to mm -hmm. the bed was printing out standoffs at the corners. Yeah. And once you have that extra um, extra layer that kind of expands outside of the corners, it'll hold down a little bit better that way. Right. And I, I thought that too. I mean, it, the supports are always good. But if you go back to that that uh, picture, Alex, you'll notice. This thing's actually pretty big. It's uh, probably at the limits of the bed, too. Yeah, it's at the very limits of the bed. But, I mean, at this size, that should be enough material touching the bed. Yeah, that to it hold it. It should hold it. The other thing you can try on, on the V2, do not use a glue stick, but you can use Aquanet. It has to be Aquanet. It has oh, to be wait. the extra hold. It Is has the, to be the unscented. That's the hairspray It's stuff, hairspray, right? It's hairspray. Yeah. Use that. Uh, put a very thin layer, super thin layer. You don't need a lot. And just <laughs> wait for it to get tacky and then start printing. That's worked on my super, super stubborn jobs. Okay, so that would solve the part at the bottom, but what is causing his printer to have like the spaghetti effect? Oh, I was actually thinking about this. Uh, the spaghetti effect, he says it crapped out as it was getting towards the top of the print. Um, he it may doesn't actually, have support. He may have a misaligned arm. Well, also, uh, even with these X braces that are on the side of the structure there, like shouldn't there be Rafts or well, that's the thing. I'm that? not sure which way he's printing this. That's that's mm. the other problem. It looks like, oh, uh, no, that's a good question. Yeah. So, uh, and you you may want to repost in, into the Google Plus group and just tell us which way is up. That always helps. That looks like the top. That yeah. I mean the that way that the the PLA has kind of melted down. That looks like the top. Yeah. But uh, the other thing you may want to do, and we covered this on an earlier episode of Know How, look for a free. It's free. Free program called Mesh. Mixer, M-E-S-H-M-I-X-E-R. There is a setting there to analyze the uh, the object, mm -hmm. and if you have overhangs, it will add supports. The supports are just like little stray noodles of PLA right. that it's will just... hold up the parts that would naturally cave in, mm -hmm. and then you just break those away after the uh, after the print. Yeah, so maybe that would help too. Help. But yeah. I think uh, if Carlos can. Did he post with the the STL file of that? No. On the, okay, because no. yeah. I'd like to take a look at that and yeah. see. Maybe play around with it myself. That's actually a good idea. So anyone who ever wants to post with a problem that they're having with printing, if you give us the STL, we can actually toy around with it. It's yeah. much easier that way. Cool. Yeah. Right. Well, there's right. kind of an answer. Half answer. Kind of. Sorry. <laughs> well, we got another 3D printing question from Ken 
Jensef. Ah, and this is in the same vein of uh, 3D printing. So he asked, 3D printer question, narrowed my choice to the Monoprice Maker Select series. Good call. For anyone that owns either the V2 or the Select Plus, I see there are tons of mods that are more or less required for the V2. Is it worth it to spend the $80 more for the Plus? Are there any required mods for the Plus? I'm ready to order as soon as tomorrow, unless there is a better choice in the sub 400 range. Very good question, and it's actually something that we did mention, uh, that I did a lot of mods on my printer. But here's the thing, I didn't have to. If you're not planning to move it around a lot, if you're not going to be jostling, it does work in its default configuration. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, I'm a maker, I'm never going to leave anything alone. So yeah. of course I'm going to make mods. Well, th there's a chance that you might bump the table that it's on, right. but also I would say you put... You stress test, I basically, do. your 3D printers. They're going 24-7, generally. Well, th there's a little counter that tells you how, how many hours it's been in operation. Yeah. And, like, my uh, my other printer says, oh, you know, 300, 300 hours. Mm -hmm. My mono price says 42 days. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's, like, the difference between a Final <laughs> Fantasy game and playing World of Warcraft. Right. Like, Forever. Forever. Forever, yeah. But, uh, of course, you're talking about the Maker Select V2 versus the uh, uh, the Plus. Now, I got the V2. Patrick actually has the Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of differences. So, of course, the V2 is a little less expensive. It's about $320 versus about $400 for the, uh, for the Plus. The print size is the same. It's about 200 by 200 millimeters by 170 or 180 millimeters, depending on how far you want to take it up. So mm -hmm. the volume that you can print is the same. Uh, the resolution is the same. It's 0.1 millimeters, so okay. 100 microns. Of uh, of resolution, which is which is pretty that's standard for right. a, a printer of that type. Uh, the same max extruder temperature at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which means they're going to support both the same types of filament. In fact, they look very much the same. Alex, I think we have a link here if you can go to it. They they look identical except for the fact that the plus has the little control box that I have on mine. It's built into the the base oh, of right, the station. Right, right, yeah. but you know not on the. Well, uh, aren't these all kind of based off that one? Guy's design that yeah. then kind of got Prusa. copied. Prusa, yeah, yeah. I feel, I feel bad. I mean, he made a beautiful machine. It's just everyone else copied it. Mm. Mm. It's open source. That's kind of the thing. Uh, here's the here's the difference though. The plus is faster. It's a lot faster. It's fifty percent faster. So the V2 can do one hundred millimeters per second. Okay. The plus does one hundred and fifty millimeters per second. Okay. That's that's kind of worth it. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I guess yeah. how much time do you have on your hands yeah. to do prototypes, exactly. right? So for me, <laughs> I, the design is pretty much the same. So, so the same kind of mods you're going to make for the V2, you're yeah. probably going to want to make for the Plus. But that speed, it does make a difference. Well, because, because, I mean, you're going to want to print at the highest resolution possible. Yes. If you can print faster, better. Well, imagine the amount of prints that you've done with oh, the printer gosh. that you have at yeah. 42 days. You would have twice as much stuff printed yeah. in that time. It'd be nice. It'd be nice. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Good to know. Well, we're going to be getting back to some of your questions, but first, you know what I want to, I want to do, Brian? What's that? I want to take a break for these messages. You know, there is something that we all do, no matter if you're into 3D printing, if you're into Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, or the Grow House series, and that is we eat. Unfortunately, what we eat is often the wrong things. We try to grab food that's around us. We try to grab food that's, that's quick. And we know that it's not good for us. But, I mean, what are the alternatives? To go to the, the supermarket every night to, to pick up fresh greens and, and fresh produce to put it together into a meal that maybe you do or do not know how to make? Well, you could go through that rigmarole. Or maybe you could satisfy yourself with fast food. Or you could get an honest-to-goodness home-cooked meal every night with Blue Apron. A Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. They deliver seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Now, every meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. It's like know-how for your food. If you spend a lot of restaurants or at high-end grocery chains, you can now spend under $10 per person per delicious meal. Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for the community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. And by shipping the exact amount of each ingredient required for a recipe, Blue Apron reduces food waste. No more having that jar of spice that sits back in the, the, the dark corners of your cupboard until it goes bad. Blue Apron just sends you what you need so you can make what you want to eat. 
Now, their freshness guarantee promises that every single ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they make it right. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental United States, and there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. And you can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences. You can choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. It's discovery for your taste buds. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. You can get recipes like lemongrass burgers and cabbage slaw with sriracha mayonnaise and pickled carrots, beef teriyaki stir-fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice, or how about roasted pork and mustard pan sauce with asparagus and fingerland potatoes? Or try some three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli with tomato and oregano dipping sauce. Wow, I'm just kind of getting hungry right now. Folks, you owe it to yourself to try Blue Apron. See what good food can do to you for a change. Check out this week's menu and get three meals free with your first purchase and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash knowhow. That's blueapron.com slash knowhow. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. Don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash knowhow now. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of know-how. Okay, Brian, so we're back. We're back. We're back, and it's time for us to take a look at toys. This is my yes. favorite part of feedback episodes, where we actually get to start taking a look at the, some of the stuff that's arrived in our labs. Mm -hmm. We've looked at speakers. We've looked at, you know, desktops. We've looked at printers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, of course, we've also looked at performance gaming notebooks. That's Which kind of... is almost an oxymoron for me. Right, A right? gaming notebook. But a this one, notebook. I just looked through the specs that you uh, had yeah, written in the bad. show notes. I want to see this. Yeah, yeah. So when we've had gaming notebooks on the show in the past, they've been kind of expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. like the Predator series, which we love. Yeah. Oh, totally. You're, I mean, for a good configuration, you can be upwards of $2,500. Yes. How or even about the Razer computers. Mm -hmm. Something like this. So this is the Acer Aspire VX15 series. Mm. Now, it is a gaming, it's a desktop replacement notebook, but here's the big difference between it and some of the other notebooks we've already on, had on know-how. Instead of starting at, say, $2,500, this starts at $800. Which is pretty acceptable for uh, a notebook at all. But, oh, uh, yeah. No. Let alone something that has these specs that yeah. I'm looking at. Yeah, this is a, so this is a 15 by 6 inch, 1920 by 1080. This is a semi-matte screen. Uh, this is a uh, IPS, so it's got great viewing angles. It's got a 7th gen Intel Core i5. This is a 7300HQ. That's a 2.5 gigahertz all the way up to 3.5 gigahertz. We've also got NVIDIA's uh, GeForce GTX 1050 Ti, it's a Ti version, with four gigabytes of GDDR5 discrete memory. It's also got the Optimus feature, so it only turns on the GPU when it actually needs it. Otherwise, That's nice. it uses the integrated video so that you can save battery power. Sure. Uh, it's got eight gigabytes of dual channel DDR4, this one. This is upgradable to 32 gigabytes, so you've got uh, you know the option to, to go ahead and- Yeah, if you wanted to space. do some video editing, oh, for yeah. sure. In fact, this is the one I used when I went away to, to Orlando. This was my editing box, and I, I was scoffed because I'm like, wait, Wait a minute, i5 for editing? Yeah. This was actually faster than my i7. So Ooh. this fifth gen i5 have a little bit of kick button. Up. It's the seventh gen i5, right? Yeah, seventh yeah. gen. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. With the, uh, and what's the battery life on it then? Well, they rate this one. It's got a three cell lithium ion battery. They rate it for six hours, which mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, great. So that means four hours. Right, this is what I think of. Um, I use this thing for eight. Not bad. It does. So my my uh, my battery times were between eight thirty and nine fifteen with the Wi-Fi off. Mm -hmm. With the Wi-Fi on, I went between six fifty and eight fifteen. Okay, right, because see, when I'm ever uh, thought about getting a gaming PC, I've always been under the assumption that I will not be gaming on it on battery power, and if right. I do, it'll be like one two hours hopefully. But if I can not game on it and get a, like an appropriate amount of battery life out of it that I want out of a laptop and then plug it in and game it on yep. it that way, that's pretty tempting. This is this is tempting. Now, now, I will say, when I was gaming on it, actually gaming, so I was playing yeah. uh, a Bioshock uh, Ultimate or Infinite. Infinite, Bioshock Infinite. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had everything on at full brightness and I killed the battery in four hours. That's that's it's normal. Still, it's, yeah, that's pretty it's, normal. But I mean, it was chug. It was everything was full power. And you've got Ethernet on here. Yeah. Huh? See, uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the port. So it's got uh, oh. USB C, USB three point one. Mm. It's also got 
two USB 3.0 ports. It's got one USB 2.0 port, HDMI, Ethernet, full-size Ethernet, which, you know, I, I kind of miss that, uh, as well as uh, a, a combo audio port and a lock port. So yeah. if you're playing, you know, in a, at a LAN party, you can actually lock this thing I down. I love this. Yeah, go about A little SD card reader, media card reader, so you can uh, you don't have to carry one with you. Uh, networking is provided both by that Ethernet port and by... Uh, a211 ABG and AC Wave 2 adapter, Bluetooth 4.0. Uh, and you know what? The audio on this is actually not bad. It's got uh, the decent power. Hmm. Um, I, 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 I brought a set of speakers with me to Orlando and I didn't need them. I just used the inboard. Nice. Yeah. And uh, for $800, that's a pretty good price for just a normal PC. It doesn't, like, I like the top finish. It does show fingerprints yeah, a little bit. We're pretty a, greasy, though. We usually eat potato I've been chips playing with your dog. Well, yeah, much. that's it. He's a greasy. Uh, my Corgi's in studio today, and he's greasy. Right. But I like this finish on top. Uh, I mean, mostly plastic construction, So, but it doesn't feel cheap at all. No, like, no. It feels like a really nice laptop. It's, it's actually, it's really firm. I was expecting, because they said, we want to send you a, a budget notebook. I'm like, uh, budget? Uh, no, send me the good stuff. This does feel like a Predator but it's you know, one third to one fourth the price of a Predator. It doesn't have all the uh, the performance, but I mean, it's, it's a five and a half pound notebook and it just, it feels nice. The keyboard I find a little bit squishy, little but bit. It's, it's firm, it doesn't flex, which is, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, and one of the other things is it does come with a, uh, this one has a 256 gigabyte M.2 SSD, so you can, you can swap that out. Super, super fast, plus, there's an additional 2.5 inch bay in here, so if you wanted to put a, a large swap. SSD or like a super big hard drive, you could do that. This screen looks pretty sharp too. Yeah, that's and that's uh, that's actually not full brightness. Where's where's brightness on this? Function and oh, function and then Ooh, arrow key. There we go. Yeah, yeah so no, it it's sharp. it's sharp and it's matte, which I like because matte yeah. does look better. It, it it represents the colors much better than a glossy screen. Okay, well, so one other question I have: How hot does it get when you're gaming? I had this thing on my lap. This thing looks time. like it's vented pretty well. Yeah, it's got two fans on it. Uh, and then, yeah, the stuff on the back there. Yeah, and it, it doesn't expel right into your lap. It's going to it's gonna push out the sides and the <laughs> These back. These little jet, they look like jet uh, intakes <laughs> or something. Look at this. I like it. And you can tell that, because uh, this is their Aspire series, but this yeah. looks more like one of their Predator series. I like this. Yeah. I like this. Because I, I feel like um, if you're going to have a travel laptop and you want a little bit of power, I also don't want something that's crazy expensive or I'm worried about scratching. Yeah. You know, like I'm going to be going through airports, I'm going to be going to hotels, I might, you know, be taking this out onto the show floor to do some editing or something. This is pretty tempting. I like this. And, you know, it's half the weight of carrying a, a, one of the larger Predator ones. So yeah. it, it is kind of portable. The Predator is one of these things where you keep it in your bag unless oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're sitting down. This is like, I actually could carry this under my arm. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's. I didn't think I was gonna like it as much as I did. I, I kind of, hmm. I I don't I don't regret buying a Predator for the for the Rome trip so yeah. that they could use it. But um, I probably could have gotten them one of these. They'd be perfectly happy. Yeah, totally. I mean, my daily driver now at work is the Microsoft Surface, which works yeah. great for everything I do here. But I'm not gonna game no, on this no. and. This, the other sacrifice that you make with this is you just don't have ports for stuff. There's right. no SD card reader, it's a one USB. So if you're gonna be doing editing out in the field, like this, this would be, and then have your secondary screen with it yeah. too. It that was perfect, perfect I, I, uh, with my little USB-C screen. It yeah. was perfect, it was great. Cool. Now that's the notebook. Now I did say one of the things I didn't like about it was the keyboard. It was a little, little yeah, mush. Squish. Right? Which, I mean, it's a chiclet keyboard, that's what you expect. Yeah. So do you have a keyboard option that you would hook up to this? Oh, maybe. I was thinking, hey, Brian, you know what? If I'm going to be gaming portably, I want an actual keyboard. I want right. a good keyboard. And I'm not talking about one that gets thrown in with my desktop. I mean, no. one that's actually designed for what I like. One that will irritate people near you because of the clicky sensation. That's a bonus, <laughs> Brian. So what we have here is this is the AW key. This is their, uh, their G KM G7. This is a mechanical keyboard. And for those of you who don't know what a mechanical keyboard is, <laughs> just know that there was a generation of us who had nothing but mechanical keyboards. We mm -hmm. grew up with mechanical keyboards and they're, they're the gold standard. And the reason why they're the gold standard, Brian, is because of this. Oh. <laughs> oh. That, 
It is a very satisfying click, it's isn't making it? making sweet love to my ears, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it makes me sad that there probably are people who have never experienced a keyboard yeah. like that in their life. It, it, well, I mean, I for the longest time, I held on to my old IBM PC keyboard. I know our director, Steve, yeah. uh, he hangs on to old Apple keyboards. Yeah, okay. this is the field. Just for that reason. All of the keyboards today, and I don't care who makes it, I mean, th there are some that are better and some that are worse, but they're all membrane. And so they, they kind of simulate a click, but it's not a mechanical mm -hmm. keyboard. It's a membrane that pops the thing back up and down. This is actually a, a it's a blue switch, based on blue switches. Okay. And it just feels so nice. <laughs> Let me see that. Oh, Let me see come that. on. Try and type come it. on, Brian. Get out of here. Ooh. Right? It's like butter. Oh. Yeah, so this is an 87 key mechanical keyboard. Oh. It's got six color backlit, uh, backlit uh, presets along with two slots for you to fill with well, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as a gaming keyboard, you have to do the, the presets so that you can light up just the keys that are required. It's for, really uh, compact too. Oh yeah. Actually, so if you can go to the overhead and, and maybe drop the lights down a little bit. I want to show some, some people a little something something. Um, you know, again, I know it's not super productive, but you know, geeks got to want geeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Brian! Cool. Wow. Oh. Did you set it to that, or is this like a This is their, like their startup. Up. This is the oh, studio. So cool. six color backlight, eight lighting presets with two custom preset slots. This thing weighs two pounds, but I mean, there is something about a mechanical key that, lights up. that just feels good. And yeah, we're suckers for things that light up and change colors, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, they, they do make a larger one of this, and they, they asked me if I wanted the, the 104 key or, or this, and I was yeah. like, you know what? Uh, the thing about the 104 key is it weighs six pounds. This thing weighs two pounds. I'm like, if I'm going to be portable with it. Yeah, keep it compact. Yeah, and this has, I mean, aside from the direction pad, this has all the keys I need for gaming. That's, yeah, all I really need. Because, I mean, it's nice to have a numpad, but that's that's my desktop. Like, I wouldn't be carrying my desktop keyboard around with me anyway. Right, so. right. Uh, now, here's, here's the super surprise, because these have been around, uh, like, with the cherry switches. Yes. But those are ridiculously expensive. Yeah, um, because that's my preference. I like the cherry keys. The and cherry keys, but I mean, like a, a decent keyboard is gonna it's gonna be cost like a, you over hundred bucks. Oh, easy. Yeah, yeah especially if it's uh, individually addressable LEDs and stuff. Yeah, like that's that. which is what this is. It starts to get pretty tricky. So. Super expensive, super tricky. Except it's this is not a hundred or more. This is actually a thirty-eight dollar keyboard. $38? This is a $38 keyboard. I know, that's what blew me away. I'm like, really? You sure you didn't get the numbers reversed? No, no. $83 and keyboard? That's, <laughs> and that's the thing. I mean, this is a great price for a mechanical. If, you, if you've ever heard about a mechanical, but you've scoffed at people paying 10 times more for their keyboard than you did for theirs, uh, for yours, buy one of these. Just buy one of these and try it and tell me that you don't prefer a mechanical keyboard. Now, you may prefer the mechanical keyboard. The people around you will hate your mechanical keyboard. <laughs> Just FYI. That's that's part of the bonus for that's you, though, isn't it? Bonus, yeah. Yeah. It makes me more annoying. You know, I'm always looking for that edge. Hmm. Well, so how long have you played with it? Have you ever have you tried popping the keys off? Uh, yeah, so is the, it easily it, it is a real mechanical keyboard. I can pop these off and put them back on without damaging anything. Oh yeah, you've got the little key. Yeah, there. look at that little key extractor. Boom. So I, I mean, yeah, this I I thought when they said that they wanted to send it to me, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be one of these cheap keyboards. I'm gonna go, oh, it's nice, but it's like everything I've I've got. Yeah. I I have a, a Rocat keyboard that we reviewed yeah. a very long time ago. And it's it's mechanical, but it wasn't great. Right. And that thing was 160 bucks. Well, and so I'm thinking about the mechanical one that I got that's LED backlit, and it was one color. Yeah. I think it was around $80. Yeah. Nice keys, but it also had two USB cables, like one right. to power it and one to be a keyboard. <laughs> and it's like, no. And so this <laughs> You're is, a keyboard. This is just one USB, which yeah. makes sense. I want to hand this over to Hal and see if he... What do you think of this one? Does this feel like one he's, of the... He's the a Apple fan thing? of mechanical keyboards. I know that. He's like, is that serviceable it, for it you? It feels like a Model M. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah right? definitely. We all know Model M. It's got that buckling spring. Exactly. Yeah, it's the two-step, the two-stage spring that people like so much. Cool. So, I don't know. I think I might have to get a couple of these things. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I do, think we need I, it for the show. I do want to check longevity, because one of the things about mechanical keyboards is they get gummed up faster so than membrane keyboards. That would be my only hesitation. Uh, you've only just had this, though. I've, I've had it for it. about two weeks. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you need somebody to do a long-term <laughs> test on it, though, I'm more than willing. Well, uh, 
we both know that you are a far better gamer than I am, <laughs> and I need every advantage I can possibly get. That's true. So does that mean I don't get a keyboard? <laughs> <laughs> We'll talk, Ryan. It comes down to we'll practice, talk. Padre. I practice, know. practice, practice. Speaking of practice, now is the time for a little surprise. And it's not just a surprise for you, it's a surprise for me, too. Yesterday, I got back to my lab. Right. And this was waiting in central stores. This is the surprise box. This is the surprise box. It's Taiwan, evidently. All right. Oh, no, it was made in Taiwan. Made in Taiwan. Got it, got it. The box or whatever's inside? Now inside. So inside, we've got ourselves a little Synology goodness. Now, we know Synology makes NASs. They also make my favorite router, the router I currently have in my network. But uh, let's see what's beneath this tamper-resistant tape. And not show off your address. Ah, people know my address. Anyway, oh, okay. So <laughs> Clearly, they're sending you mystery boxes. So. <laughs> so at least Synology knows my address. <laughs> Besides, it's not my address, it's the address of the school. So if there's no uh, follow-up episode to this, we'll know that this was a This a was a bad idea. Oh, so it is, okay, it is a NAS, so it's a disk station. Uh, but I don't know which disk station it might be. You want to pull it out, I'll hold the box? Sure. Huh. Huh. Ooh, she's Ooh. heavy. She's got some heft to it. It's a 1517. Oh, this is brand spanking new. I Wait a minute, whoa. The I think... I don't know what that means. I think this might be the one that's equipped with 10 gig LAN ports. 10 gig lamp. Ah. Actually, that sounds pretty awesome. Unbox. Come on, we have to unbox this thing, Brian. <laughs> I want to see what's inside here now. Actually, you know, let's back you off. I didn't realize that was going to be so. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh wrong direction. <laughs> We're our own camera. There we go. Okay. There we go. You, yeah, you yeah, get that. I'll That's take that. You. Thank you. You get that. Power too. cable. That quick uh, installation. Instructions. instructions. Don't need that. Hey, you want to hold that down? <laughs> nice. So this, you, know, you, all, you all have seen the 1515 Plus that I love so much. Right. Because I've got two of them. I've got my, uh, my standard and my hot standby. This, I believe, is the next version up. So they've added a little bit of uh, processing power. They've given a little extra speed. This thing feels like they fully populated it, which... <laughs> I was going to say, it was pretty heavy. Yeah. Oh. Oh, can you want to... Yeah, get this little... There we Whoop. go. Oh. Mmm, smells new. Oh my goodness. Yes, okay, so, oh, oh, I can't believe this. So just like the 1515, I've got the four gigabit ethernet ports, right? Mm -hmm. I've got an e two eSATA connectors, so I can either expand it to an eSATA drive or to a chassis. Yeah. I, I've got USB 3, so I can both hook up external uh, drives, plus I could also use this to like hook up uh, a wireless dongle. Yeah. But then, whoop, this, Brian? Fiber? That is the SFP Plus port so I can hook up 10 gigabit Ethernet. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Two of them. Oh, my goodness. So this, this, this was a problem because these, these NASs were getting so fast yeah. that unless you had uh, a switch and a client that mm -hmm. could bond Ethernet, you couldn't get as much throughput out of this as it could actually pr uh, provide. Yeah. Now, with two 10 gig Ethernet, not a problem. You might want to uh, brush the drool off of your oh, mouth real so quick nice. before. It... <laughs> Brian, look at this thing. It's so cute. Oh my gosh. I'm so happy. I can tell. Uh, you know what? Um, I was going to go to Las Vegas for NAB and I was going to bring some stuff with me. You might just bring this, this instead. Is coming. Yeah. This is coming. But now I have to, I have to, break up, I have to bust out uh, one of my spare 10 gig switches because I. Oh. Nice. Yeah. It's. Ooh, it's well built. I, okay, this okay. So this was a surprise unboxing. I I do want to give you all a proper first look at this thing because this, I mean, it's got all the same quality that I, that I expect out of my fifteen fifteen. But again, with that that ten gig Ethernet port, I I don't even know what it would be able to do. <laughs> I think we're gonna have to do some benchmarks, right? I, well, I want to equip this thing with SSDs. If I can, if I can get twenty gig out of this thing by bonding those two ports together, <laughs> you're a madman. It's just going to get light on fire. Synology, you have made me so happy. For as long as you let me hold on to this, I will. I will. <laughs> as you test it out. Well, don't forget the instructions. You're going to need those. Yeah. Garbage. Garbage. I'm, a, I'm a man, Brian. I don't need <laughs> instructions. I don't Actually, I'm probably going to need those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here, no, the I'll funny thing the is, not too long ago, a 10 gig port would cost you at least $3,000, a yeah, single is, 10 gig port. What does this cost? Should we I look it up? I have no idea. Yeah. yeah, actually, is this even available? Did they send me a prototype? Uh, Not a prototype, <laughs> but a, an early sample? DS1517 Plus. DS1517 Plus. It's a quad-core CPU. Oh. Optional M.2 SSD support. 
Uh, okay, what's BTRFS? What's that mean? Uh, that, that's a file protocol. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay, so the 1517, the bare one with the 8 gigabytes of memory, which is what this has, goes for about $912, mm -hmm. but then you add in the 10 gig uh, interface card. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Mobile oh, management, oh, surveillance, I've... backup, data security. Oh my gosh! It has. Uh, you can do an. Uh, you can use an MD two one uh, uh, M two D one seven adapter, mm -hmm. and you could put dual M dot two cards in this thing. Damn. Seriously! Oh my gosh! Synology. Cool beans. Yeah. All right. Uh, this is going to be a first look, and then we're going to do a full review on this. Mm -hmm. And this is going in my box. Don't let Brian touch it. PCIe slot. Oh man. It's gone, you, sure, you sure you don't need someone else to test this in a keyboard for you? <sighs> hey, Brian, you know, I think, yeah, you can have the keyboard now. Uh, damn it. <laughs> I should have my mouth shut. <laughs> All right, folks, when we come back, we've got more of your questions and our answers. But first, I want to go ahead and take another break to thank another sponsor sure. of Know How. Hey, Brian. What's up? I know... It's not so much a problem for me. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I know sometimes you have problems with the whole facial hair thing. Oh, yeah, the shaving thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I have to do that occasionally. Yeah, you I, know, not just once a month. I, I kind of, I just, you know, sandpaper a tiny bit, <laughs> like once a month and I'm, I'm good to go. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, it, you know, I, I'm not matching my, uh, my photo or my drawing on the, on the board over there. But it, occasionally I do like to not be so hairy. Yeah, and the thing is, for, for people like you who are often hairy, as you know, you can see in your <coughs> close-up videos. Uh, I don't shaving, know what you're talking about. Shaving mm -hmm. can be a chore, right? It can be a bit of a, a chore, and uh, if if I want to do it right, I, I want to enjoy it. So yeah. that's why uh, I use the Harry's razor. I will say this: there was one time I was I was with a benefactor, and they decided to take me to it was like a spa day or something. Spa day, which I thought was ridiculous, but. Okay. Yeah, why not? Continue. And they uh, they kind of pampered me, and they gave me like the hot, warm towel shave. And I thought, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? I wish it could be like this every day. Mm -hmm. it, it does kind of change how you look at that time that you, you spend doing personal grooming from. Yeah. It's something I have to do, too. It could actually be kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh as a man, my normal tendency is to just uh, not really treat myself, but like when you have all the accessories and stuff that you can get from Harry's, like the shaving cream, I didn't even know what uh, post balm yep. s solve or no, what is it? Uh, aftershave. It's aftershave. basically aftershave. Yeah. Why would I use that? Because it smells really good it smells and really it good. feels better it after feels you use good. it. But like, I wouldn't have gone out of my way otherwise if it didn't all come in one bundle. Yeah, I think this is all a long way to say that, <laughs> you know what, if you've been having that really, really bad experience shaving, if you do think it's a chore, maybe it's time for you to try Harry's. Now, Harry's is the place, the one-stop shop that you can go to to get all your shaving needs. Out for years, for decades, one big razor company, and you know who I'm talking about, has relentlessly increased prices and reaped immense profits at the expense of their customers. Harry's wants to change all that. If you haven't heard of them before, Harry's was started by two best friends, Jeff and Andy. They were fed up with being overcharged for razors that were kept behind some plastic fence like it was in Fort Knox. So they started their own razor company to give people what they deserve, a great shave at a fair price. Harry's shave sets start at just $15, and they include everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. That includes a weighted ergonomic handle, five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering gel, a travel blade cover, and, well, this. It just makes it an experience. It makes it something that you look forward to rather than a chore. Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades that they want you to try their shave set for free. You just cover shipping when you sign up. You heard that right. Start your free trial today at harrys.com slash knowhow. Turn your chore into a personal spa day. That's harrys.com slash knowhow. harrys.com slash knowhow. And we thank Harry's for their support of knowhow. Mm. All right, Brian, let's get back to it. Sure. We got a little bit more feedback that we want to cover before we end the episode. Uh, first of all, we've got something here from uh, Harry Henze, I think. Yeah. Henze, probably. And this is, uh, so Harry asks, I have taught myself some coding from Crystal Reports, Excel, VBA, and WinBatch, but I would like to learn more. 
I work two jobs and have kids with medical problems. I don't have time to go to class. What are your suggestions? Thanks in advance. Harry, first of all, I'm very sorry to hear about your kids. You know, anytime kids need medical attention, it's mm -hmm. it's sad. It's 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 a little disappointing. But right. I'm glad that you're looking forward to learning a little bit of coding. That's yeah, much more. It's very yeah. admirable. Yeah. Very, very admirable. So kudos, absolute kudos to you. Here's the thing. I get this question a lot. People say, well, what programming language should I learn? And mm -hmm. the answer is Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, I, I, I don't um, want to be flippant. You know, I had that same problem. I, I didn't know what coding to start with, but it also depends on where you want to go. Yeah. So what do you, you want to do? do? And I think when I was asking you what code I should start with, I think you recommended C plus a lot, and yeah. that was one of the classes that was offered at my community college. So I took that just to get kind of into it, and then realized that I liked it, and it gave gave me the basics. But I enjoyed Python yeah. using Python yeah. more than I did that. Kind of clicked with me more, and was more in line of some of the projects that I wanted to play with. And, and see, that's the thing. When you talk about what should I program on. The answer is whatever you're going to program on. Yeah. You find the thing that you want to do and you pick the language for it. The language, believe it or not, is actually inconsequential because it's the programming thought. It's, it's the, the way that you think. Precisely. Yeah. Because a loop is a loop, no matter if you're in Python or C. Mm -hmm. Syntax is a little bit different, but it's, it's going to work the same. When you're talking about logic trees, it's going to work the same way as it does in Java, as it does in Go. Right. Again, it's just syntax. But what you need is something that you can get into. And what, mm -hmm. I, what I mean by that is, if you pick a programming language that is so complicated, so hard to learn for the beginner, or so ephemeral, right. it, it doesn't have any real world impact other than what you see on your screen, mm -hmm. it's hard to stay with it. What I always recommend, and this is why I recommended C plus to you, is an Arduino. Yeah. Pick up an Arduino because it does something in the real world right. that it kind of, there's, there's an extra reward you get when you see it actually working, mm -hmm. and you realize my code did something actual. Yeah, the, uh, something about bringing it into the physical sense is definitely um, triggered or sparked yeah. my interest more, and where we were using Arduinos for a lot of our projects, and just the ability to you know, set something in the code and then say, move the arm you know, three quarters to the left, upload to the, the, the Arduino. And it's a very low barrier of mm -hmm. learning curve along with just financially. Like right. you could just get yourself a cheap Arduino. It's $3, get literally $3. The IDE, you yeah. don't have to pay for that. And there's so much information online that you could start like a little project, fiddle with the code, and then start the learning process. Yeah. yeah. And you know, something we used to recommend when we were still doing Coding 101 was just mess around. There's so many examples for Arduino that you can just copy and paste, you put it in there, and then you start changing little things until it breaks. That's one of the best ways to learn if, if you're not going to be doing it professionally immediately. That's a great way to learn because it allows you to take what other people have done, customize it in your way, and you'll notice after, after a while of doing that, you just start to naturally know which commands do what and how you solve a particular problem. Remember, coding is all about finding something in the real world and then writing code to fix it. So now I have to do a little bit of research because I don't know what Crystal Reports is, but it's apparently a business intelligence application. Yep. Is that, do you know what that is? It's, it's a scripting language. It's a scripting language, yeah. and I mean, Excel, VBA, and what's WinBatch exactly, do you know? Uh, it's probably like a, uh, like a, what do you call it, a batch file processor? I Some, haven't heard something of it. like, oh, what's the one I, oh, I used to play with it all the time. Okay, yeah. so I mean, he's already kind of gotten himself started yeah. into it and taught himself some stuff. And I mean, if you want to have the physicality of the Arduino, I'd recommend that. But um, as far as like going, continuing with the, what, the path that he's on now, just focus on a language yeah. and learn it. And then when you do, if there's a job that you have in mind that you've then, like you realize mm -hmm. you have to learn mm -hmm. that language, you already have one in your repertoire that you, it's way easier to switch to another one once you've already like mastered yeah. one. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and, go ahead and download Visual Studio uh, from Microsoft. It's mm -hmm. free. You can get it for free because you're not using it for professional use. And it has several different frameworks in there that you can play with and a lot of examples. Uh, and again, doesn't matter what language you, pro you, you choose as long as you can stay with it. Yeah, stay with it, learn the fundamentals, and then you can transfer those to any language after right. you've learned it. Yeah, just syntax after that. Now let's go to another one. We've got one from Omer Donmez. So Omer asks, I recently listened to KH286 about Raspberry Pi gaming machines. Afterwards, I was inspired to create a Raspberry Pi gaming machine to oh, gift to my good. fiance for her birthday. Perfect. 
She loves playing the NES and N64 games. I already purchased the Raspberry Pi 3 and I'm about to install RetroPie onto it. I now need to find ROMs to play. Do you have any suggestions where to find clean, <laughs> safe ROMs? Thank you for a great show and amazing work. I love listening to Twitch. <sighs> we get this a lot. Um, here's the thing, folks. It's actually illegal for you to yes. trade ROMs. Even if you... So I think it's... Because uh, Radford Castro, who used to be mm -hmm. an employee here, he pioneered how yeah, yeah. to rip games from cartridges and make ROMs he out of them. He literally wrote the book he, on it. He literally wrote the book on it. And I remember having a discussion with him about the legality of ROMs and things. And his standpoint was, if you own the game, like you purchase the cartridge, and there's not really an available way to get it, he, like... Yeah. Like, I guess legally you can rip it from the cartridge and then that's your copy there's, of the there's game. There's actually a DMCA exception if the if it's, if the media is no longer playable. Yes. But, I mean, we are in a super gray area and if it goes to court, you will lose, period. Right. That's, that's a given. But here's the thing. We can't tell you because then we become legally liable. <laughs> However, we all know where you can get them. Yeah, um, so usually when I get questions like these, I'm like, oh, it's law enforcement asking if uh, I downloaded yeah. any ROMs illegally. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, so we can't we can't tell you, and we can't even tell you any of the places that we trust. We can't even tell you whether or not we've done it. No, um, I have we, not. We will say it's actually relatively easy. It is. I, it's... It's uh, it is a gray area. I'm trying to think of how to word this without implicating myself. <laughs> uh, you know, I have allegedly. A, allegedly, I may or may not have gotten a lot of ROMs from friends. Like usually, that's how. That's usually like, the best way to do it. Someone you trust. I would you, not trust a Juarez site. Um, no, no. Uh, your best friend is Google. Uh, you know, as a search engine, do a little bit of research. Uh, have some ad blockers on, probably. Yeah. Have no script enabled. Um, I don't know if Tor is really... Uh, Tor won't help you, no. but <laughs> what I would do is, I w if, if you really are serious about this, and you've got Windows 10 or another operating system that mm -hmm. supports a hypervisor, start up like an instance, an instance of your operating system that can be destroyed yeah. right after you're done with it. Yeah, because if you, if you, you are, do go to the wrong yeah. website and download the wrong thing, you will be you crawling pwned. on the dark side. But just do a little bit of research on Google. Uh, maybe dig through some forums or something. Uh, it's really not that difficult to find ROMs. It's not. It's super, uh, super easy. But we can't tell you. No, but good luck on the project. It's a lot of fun. There's actually a lot of free games yeah. out there, like Cave Story is one of them, too. Cave Story is so. a great game. Great it's game. actually a really good game. Mm -hmm. So, this, you know, not necessarily that you have to, like, download Do illegal. it yeah. illegally. But, uh, In fact, good luck Cave Story the is the only game I have on my, my RetroPie. Yeah, because it comes, I think it comes pre-installed with the RetroPie project. Um, I don't have any of those other games. Yeah. At all. No. no that no. I've spent hours playing. No. Never. The nice thing is, is once you do may or may not have gotten those games from friends, uh, you have them forever. Just keep them, you know, archived them on your uh, your NAS. So whenever you do another <laughs> Raspberry Pi project, you have them. All right, let's do one more. We've got one more from Jason Perry, okay. who uh, actually wants to go back to Grow How. Okay, so Jason asks, looking for suggestions. My grow table came with the house. Okay, this <laughs> that's always a plus, yeah, yeah, right? That's good. Uh, this happens every year. Uh, you have over a month till I want to move these outside, okay? But they are growing above the lights. I clearly have a need for a version two. What would your multi-level grow table do to an extend a plant's lifespan on a table before they have to be moved? This is actually a very good question, Jason. I, I'm glad you asked it. The first thing you, I can, if you, actually, Alex, go back to that picture. The first thing you'll notice, these are very leggy, very leggy, leggy stems. Yeah. What that means is that the light was too far away. And what, so they're reaching. Right. So plants will naturally stretch towards the light. So you want an adjustable light because what you can do is you can actually lower the light when they're in the early germination stage so that mm, they're not mm -hmm. constantly stretching, which means they're not going to get too close to the light. And then you just gradually lift it as they get uh, higher and higher and higher. Now, you've got a very specific issue because you want to be using these outdoors. You're just growing them, you're Getting starting them started, indoors. Yeah. Right, so that you, they'll survive the winter, survive the, th the frost. Mm -hmm. Feel free, do not be afraid to trim back. Plants actually do better when you trim them back. We've shown you on Grow How, when you trim, at like the terminal, the terminal stem, what's going to happen is the two stems on the other on either side will grow out. You you will mm -hmm. make a bushier plant. That's 
typically what people want. Yeah. You, you want more produce. You more want more production. concentrated that way. Yeah. Precisely. So uh, the two things is get your light movable. And you've seen us on on Grow How show you those super cheap racket, uh, rac ratchets that we got at Amazon. <laughs> yeah. little, just little pulleys mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, they, they cost, what, a buck fifty each. Right. You put that on your light and you just raise it or lower it depending on how, how high your, uh, your plants are right. and then trim them back to, so that they'll stay manageable during the winter. Mm -hmm. Or even if you don't have, I don't know, the available space to lower or raise your light, I guess you could just put like boards or something yeah. underneath and, and slowly lower it or raise it depending on what you need. But do you still have the picture up, Al, because um, I noticed so it's really yeah. arched too. Yep. Like the plants are really tall in the middle and short on the sides. So should he be like rotating them or have like some reflectiveness on the sides to get more of an you, even? You might, yeah. I mean, typically a grow are those table. Different plants. You're not going to be being on a grow table for for a super long time. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, if you look at this picture, he's got some starts that are way down and some that are way up. That's yeah. that's because they're different plants because they're different breeds. Okay. okay. But uh, it never hurts. To, I, I always have milk crates. So you can raise up some of the plants that are really, really short. Because what's going to happen here yeah. is that those large leafy plants are going to start shading the smaller ones. If you lift them up so that their canopies are all uniform, you get a much better distribution of light. We've had that problem with the... Um, yeah, just with the arrow garden. The arrow garden, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the basil grows so fast and it's so leafy, it'll grow over the other plants. Mm, and now they're, the other plants are just sitting there going, okay, I guess I'm not growing anymore. I'm just going to be sad now. Yeah, <laughs> I think the poor dill is the one that gets it the worst. The dill, the dill gets destroyed. <laughs> we, we finally... We had been trying to kill a plant. We've been like trimming, aggressively trimming back. We finally yeah. trimmed it all the way to a nub. And it, it still back? sprouted. <laughs> and I'm like, no. And I cut it again. And I guess I had cut it just oh. soon enough where there wasn't enough energy left in the stem. It's like, Goodbye. It's like, ah. What was it? Was it the dill? It was dill. That you uh, yeah. dill. I remember the parsley you kept trying to kill too. You can't kill parsley. No. That like root bamboo. system pretty much took over everything on, <laughs> it, in there. It grew into the pulp. <laughs> went inside it's the trying pump. to escape. <laughs> it was trying to commit it's suicide. Sentient. It's like, chop me up. Ah. <laughs> Kill me. Uh, go figure. Hmm. All right, folks, we've had a lot of fun, and we know that there's a lot of information here, everything from the products that we took a look at to some of the links for uh, the answers to your questions. We want to make sure you can get to them easily. Brian, do we have a place? Oh, uh, we central have. Central Repository? Yes, yes, and it's on available on the World Wide Internet. The and internet's it lives at twit.tv slash kh. Yes, the internets. The series of tubes that lead to our content is at twit.tv slash kh. And like Padre had mentioned, all the show notes from this episode link to the very affordable gaming laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, they, probably the, the Synology, um, whenever that comes it's available. It's never coming back. It's, I'm never going to get to play with that, no, am I? No, it's mine now. <laughs> but you can also download it. Synology demands it back. And I'll go, it got lost. It's, yeah, it got lost. But, you know, Padre, that's okay. Yeah. Because I like to spend my time looking at other people's projects. And there's a place for them to do that or ask questions like they did on this episode. Yeah, and it's on Google+. Plus. Just go to Plus, look for know-how. And once you ask to be added to the group, it's a very short approval process because we have to keep out all the spammers. You get access to over 11,000 kitas. That's our know-it-alls, people who are at all stages of their maker DIYer journey. You can ask questions about a project. Maybe you can pick up a couple of ideas for future projects. Or if you're an expert, why not help the young folk or the inexperienced folk to get into the game? This is a community. This is something that we can make. And you can do it, again, by going to Google Plus and looking for know-how. That's right, but that's not the only place you can find us. If you want to see GIFs or even maybe pictures of my dog Tibbs, <laughs> which I don't water. know if you can pick that up over the mic. Come on, Tibbs. He's in studio today. He's, we have a studio dog again. He's yeah. slurping up water like a madman right now. Yeah, are you done? You done? We're just, we're just doing a show. It's cool. He's just looking at you like, where are we going home? Yeah, he's, he's <laughs> bored. Uh, but you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Crank underscore Hippo. And you're going to find me at Padre SJ. And you're going to find the third member of our crew who is right now laughing at Turbs. Uh, we call him uh, Jimbo. You can find Jimbo at twitter.com slash a n e l f. That's pronounced Alex. Uh, Jimbo's much better. Okay, you can find Alex Jimbo at twitter.com slash A-N-E-L-F-3. By the way, this is the Turbles. This is, this Hi, is our Corgi. He's a good this boy. This is our mascot. Yeah. My bud. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burdett. And now that you Corgi how? Go Corgi?
Oh, he's so happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> you sit on the table. Koki, 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 rocking everywhere. 